Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm Sithara Shefta. To briefly introduce a little bit about myself, I started my career in the games industry about 12 years ago. And, there are some of, and these are some of the games and initiatives I've been part of in that time. I spent the first eight years developing my skills in games production, and that path ultimately led me to where I am today, as studio head of No Breaks Games. And as studio head, my role is focused on a number of things, including studio direction, game and franchise direction, business development, and production management. No Breaks Games are the developers of Human Fall Flat, and we're currently developing the recently announced sequel, Human Fall Flat 2. Our studio is based in Tenerife in the Canary Islands, and we established ourselves there at the beginning of 2019. Since then, we've grown our team to include 26 people, and a couple of years ago, we also opened our sister studio in Lithuania. When the opportunity to create a studio arose, it was something that I was really excited about. I knew that if I was to pursue this, I wanted to do it the right way. And by that, what I mean is I wanted to create an environment which enabled and empowered people to make fun and great games in a collaborative, inspiring, and ethical way. That was about four and a half years ago. And this talk is about some of the learnings I've made along the way about leadership and running a studio and why with great power comes great responsibility. So specifically today, we're going to cover the following, how we figured out the objectives and built our studio culture and the steps we took to do so, why your people should matter the most, how to be central to your team rather than above it and examples of leading from within your team, maintaining an evolving culture at an ever-growing studio, why crunch is damaging to your business and how to not crunch, the realities and pressures that come with leadership and the coping strategies as well, including how to make decisions with confidence, dealing with errors being made in your team, improving performance, and knowing when it's time to remove obstacles or people. And finally, we'll end with a summary of all of our learnings. So it was my first time setting up a studio, and I had the challenge of figuring out how to do it, and hopefully how to do it well along the way. I was starting a studio from scratch, we had no team, but we did have an existing IP already because Human Fall Flat came out back in 2016. I'd also just moved to a new country where I did not speak the language and had to learn the process of establishing a business in Spain. And all of that alongside, you know, the usual things of building development team, game, and studio from scratch. So it's gonna be easy, right? Um, and one of the first things I needed to do was to establish the intent for the studio. I was building a team to take care of and grow a well-loved game whilst also building upon its success and turning it into what we hope will become a well-loved franchise. And at this point, I had to start considering what tools and processes we needed to put in place to help our team achieve all of this and what type of people we needed to hire or partner with in order to be successful and how I wanted people to feel as part of this team. So I started with what I consider a really basic principle. Games are fun to play, so we should have fun making them. I certainly didn't get into this industry for the meetings and Excel sheets, despite what some people will tell you. I got into it because I find a joy and spark in being creative. And I think that's why most of us who work in this industry want to do so, because we just want to make games. I have this philosophy that you spend so much of your time at work, so ideally, you should enjoy coming to work every day. At least some, that's something that I really like to feel, and now I have that opportunity to create that space for others. And one of the worst things, in my opinion, is to work somewhere where you don't get to enjoy that spark or where innovation is limited, because I don't think that provides people with the opportunity to flourish. I knew that I wanted to create an environment where people feel happy to be coming into the studio, whether that was in person or virtually, where people feel motivated and driven about what they're doing, and where we can really empower people to be at their best. And that led me to think about our values, <coughs> something critical that I believe you have to establish up front and be very clear about, as it sets the foundation for everything you do going forward. So I created a set of values that are instilled with one core thing in mind, what we wanted for our team. These values also set the tone for who I wanted to be and who I needed to be in my role, because it's incredibly important to lead by example. So this was step one. 
And to briefly talk about our values and more importantly, why we chose these. I believe that anyone works at their best when they're proud of what they're accomplishing, whether that's on an individual basis or together as a team. So we strive for quality in our games and in our studio um, and also in our personal development. And we also celebrate creating an inclusive space for people from different backgrounds and experiences and welcome new perspectives which challenge our thinking. Diversity reminds us that it's okay to do things differently. And we enjoy what we do and we want to share that fun and joy with others. I also believe that people who are passionate about what they do and have some, autonomous, have some autonomy to continuously learn, improve and develop also drive things forward and they contribute their best. And that in turn feeds into the success of any business objectives. And that good contribution and ideas can come from anywhere. And that's more likely to happen when we champion one another and create a supportive environment where we share knowledge, skills, and regardless of discipline or seniority. No egos, just open collaboration, where we all act with integrity, transparency, and accountability and have fair and ethical standards so that people can be their authentic selves. So these were now a pillar for our mindset and our behavior as a team moving forward, all made with one thing in mind, making a great culture and environment for our people. So people should be your top priority. Look after your people because, well, it's just the right thing to do. And fundamentally, they look after your business. One doesn't work without the other. And I think the reason why is really simple. Treat others as you want to be treated and happy people make great games which leads me to my very simple diagram. So if your people are happy, they make a great game, which makes your players happy, which makes your business happy, and then we all share in that success and happiness and the cycle just keeps going. So be sure to give a damn about your people and make time for them, whether that's being a sounding board or being a guide or just asking them how they are. And you need to be what they need you to be on that day as their lead. And if you hire great talent and think that's enough, you will inevitably lose staff. Retention is key to both a successful team and business and is a reflection of your studio or team culture, which in turn is a reflection of your leadership style. So don't make the mistake of shifting to the mentality that people are just bums on seats. That's how you'll lose your best talent. And be sure that as your team or your studio grows, you share that vision and philosophy with other people who make up that leadership team, as you have to trust them to instill that too. And central to all of that is your studio's culture and well-being. So everything's a cycle, which if done, if done well, it's not only preserved, but it's ever growing and evolving and should lead to a constant return in investment, whether that's in your staff's talent and helping them to learn and develop further and then retaining them to help create something bigger and better, or whether that's simply making enough money to keep your team and studio comfortable. And one of the most powerful tools for anyone in a leadership position is their rapport with the team. Because with better communication, you get more visibility, transparency, and insight, whether that's on a personal project or studio level. And in order to build rapport, you also have to earn their trust and respect. Your job title or position never entitles you to this. One of the ways of doing this is by being a person who leads with empathy. This doesn't mean you always have to agree with everything, but it's about listening with an open mind and putting yourself in their shoes and also acknowledging them so they know they are heard. It's then about guiding them and providing feedback or decisions with context. So this starts to build a relationship of trust and transparency as the team feel more comfortable coming to talk to you about things. And in turn, it means you can be a better lead. And that's the difference between being a boss and being a leader, between saying you're approachable and actually being approachable. To succeed as a lead, you have to be central to your team, not above it. That's not to say there's no longer some structure or hierarchy, but it's about not dictating to the team from afar and providing zero explanations. And it means not coming in unpredictably and being disruptive. You should be involved in the day-to-day -day and participating in conversations and the projects to help drive it forward in a constructive way and making yourself accessible in order to do so. And there's a few simple ways that I believe can help you. And some of these might sound very obvious to you. If you're working in the studio, sit with the rest of the team, wherever it's possible. It's a two-way thing as it immediately makes you accessible, but also it means you can participate in or have awareness of those spur of the moment conversations as they happen. And it's an easy tool to realize if someone might be struggling with something that they're working on, or perhaps even with another team member. 
And it gives you the opportunity to help guide the conversation if it's necessary, or perhaps feed into any decisions or direction that is needed. It also helps you to just get to know your team better and helps the team to get to know you better and really build that relationship. Another thing that you can do is engage with everyone on your team. And by that, I don't mean you have to always be speaking to every single person at all times. But by taking part in your team's conversation, whether they're in person or over Slack, you don't close yourself off from someone just because they're more junior to you or in a different discipline. This is effectively another way of sitting with your team, even if it's remote. And keep your team up to date with what's going on across the wider projects or studio, depending on what your position is. It's very easy for people to start working in their own little bubbles and then become siloed. And then they might not realize what else is going on that could affect them. And people start to feel disconnected quickly if they're uninformed and they think they're not valued. This is where you being central comes into play again. So we have studio kickoffs, which were a meeting that happen about um, every two or three months when we're about to start a new milestone as we find that to be a good cadence by which, there's useful, by which time there's useful or in, interesting information to share with people. And everyone on the team comes along and we start those kickoffs with a studio update. So we go through things sequentially, like any new roles we're opening and why, um, any confirmed new starters coming on board, if anyone's leaving the team and upcoming events of importance. And then we go through the deliverables for the next milestone, which are put together beforehand with the team, maybe on an, on an individual or feature level basis. But now they're shared with everyone for visibility and the opportunity to provide context and ask questions. It just takes us about half an hour and it's a nice way for us all to get together and understand how we're moving forward together in a positive direction. And you've probably all had moments like me when you're working on something, but it's not quite perfect yet. So you don't want to share it with everyone for feedback or critique. So this hesitancy or anxiety builds. And that's partly a normal fear or reservation anyone can have. But I wanted to put this at ease for my team. So this is why when we do things like feature reviews, they aren't done behind closed doors. They're done with the developers who are working on those particular bits. Rather than a big scary meeting where people are worried about disappointing the leads or stakeholders, they're an open discussion about the work. So what do people think is going well? Where are they struggling? And what support they might need? And because we've tried to remove the fear from these situations, the people talking through their work usually turn up and say, hey, yeah, so this bit's a bit rubbish. And here's why I think it's a bit rubbish. I think I'm going to fix it by doing this. Or they turn up and say, I'm stuck on this bit and I need help. And I think it's very reaffirming that when people feel comfortable enough to be critical of their own work without fear, because they know it's a safe and constructive space in which to do so. And when any of the leads or stakeholders are sharing their thoughts, it's not a case of, I don't like it, so we're not doing it. It's a case of, I'm not sure this is working and this is why. And then everyone contributes with potential solutions. So I try to present my team the feedback or the problem rather than the solution every time. And instead, I help to drive the conversation in a way where I ask questions that help lead them to the solution. Because I hired them because I really hope they're smarter than me. And trusting them to find solutions also makes them feel valued and shows that I respect them. It's important that your team feel comfortable enough to hear your thoughts directly because it means you've built a good rapport and a good relationship with them. And suddenly you aren't a tyrant that might change the direction of everything with a snap of a finger, but you're their guide who will give them honest, open and transparent feedback with full context. So then it makes sense if you do decide to change direction. In turn, that also helps you to gain their trust and respect as they get an understanding of why feedback has been given or why direction has been taken. Be straight with them, be clear with them, just don't be a dick. I also think this helps to develop their knowledge and feeds into mentorship because they have more of an understanding of the end game. Do you see what I did there? Um, and as much as we try to help people not be precious about their work, it can be hard to make changes to something you've spent a long time on. So regular feature reviews are advised to minimize impacts all around. And the more you can create the sense of it being our work rather than individuals, that will always really help. Another thing we do are milestone reviews. Now, these are done a little bit differently to what I've seen elsewhere, where sometimes there'd be a point of panic or stress amongst the team because suddenly people are putting all of their work in front of the stakeholders. Ah, oh, that's terrifying. Okay. So now I still think it's really important that stakeholders participate in a milestone review 
So hours are done with the whole team, including the leadership group and our publishers as well. But we've already spent the prior couple of months doing these feature reviews that we've just discussed to figure things out and provide critique and resolve issues. Whereas our milestone reviews are very different. They're actually something that we look forward to. And you can just ask some of my team. I'm not lying, I swear. <laughs> um, they're a celebration, an acknowledgement, and a recognition of everyone's efforts and contribution. The whole team comes together to show off what we've been working on. They talk through the processes and the results, and that's really quite empowering. And it's even at a point where people prepare special content for it, like recording music video montages of their work to see who can do the most embarrassing thing. We laugh with our team, even if things might go wrong, like when inevitably one of our level designers, whose name I'm not going to name, Lee, can't quite make the jump they've designed because it doesn't matter if you don't present your stuff perfectly. We're all just here to see how the project is progressing and celebrate our achievements together. I still think it's incredibly important to acknowledge when things go wrong and learn from those mistakes, but that's something we should be doing all of the time. And if we're constantly keeping on top of things and importantly playing the game, then those problems will get caught out before they turn into failures. So that sense of fear or intimidation is really stripped away from our milestone reviews. And it's also quite uplifting and inspiring for people to see other parts of the project going well, even if maybe there's, their work didn't this time. Because even in those circumstances where things don't go to plan, there's still always something that people can present that they've learned from. So moving on, I think it's healthy to reflect on what can be done to continuously improve culture within your team or studio. And this becomes even more important as your team grows. There's a risk that the culture could negatively change or become lost if you don't consider this as part of your growth plans. I think we've been quite successful at maintaining and scaling what we set out to achieve. And here's a few things that have been considerably important in doing that. So whilst there's some structure or hierarchy within the studio so that responsibility is still clear, we never allow for someone's position to separate or make them inaccessible. And this helps to keep communication flowing effectively as everything is still direct. And we strive to maintain this throughout more growth. And working across discipline teams also helps, as team members are always speaking to different people depending on what they're working on. We also ask, um, make sure to ask the team to provide their feedback through anonymous surveys from time to time and ask them for suggestions on how we could improve. So for instance, at one point, we realized that some of our remote staff were starting to feel a little bit disconnected with those people who were on site. And so we put in place things like virtual coffee breaks where anyone on the team can participate over a video call to casually chat. Or we introduce less formal catch-up meetings where the team show each other what they've been working on and bounce ideas around. And those are inspired by those water cooler conversations that used to happen in the office. And our artists, I think they call it the goofs and gaffs meeting, although I'm not really sure why. Um, and we try to send cupcakes or treats to everyone for the milestone reviews so they can still participate in the same celebratory atmosphere even if they're not in the office. And you might consider these very small touches, but sometimes the little but considerate things can go a very long way. I'm also still the first person to welcome a new team member to the studio. It gives it a bit more of a personal touch and sets the tone for what it's like to work out on our team. And I think it's invaluable to spend that first half an hour or hour with people to help put them at ease and also to be very clear and transparent in demonstrating our values. We also provide 360 feedback to one another through a one-to-one -one process, which is designed to help with learning and development. And it allows people to bring up points for improvement, but importantly, not only for their peers, but also for their seniors and leads. And it helps to maintain and evolve the culture. So I don't feel like I can talk about leadership without talking about this next part. Because during my career, I've been a part of teams where we've crunched, and some of these were for shorter periods of a couple of months, and on other occasions for more than a year. Each time, there was always some justification for why it was necessary. We needed to work long hours and weekends because otherwise the game wouldn't get shipped on time. Or we need to prove our dedication and commitment to the company. Or we need to crunch because otherwise we would all lose our jobs. Or we have to crunch because that's what game developers do. What a load of bullshit. I often remember times when crunch was glorified and some of the leads and managers would hold it up as a kind of badge of honor. Each time I crunched, it burned me out. It burned out my health, both mentally and physically. It burned out my passion. And at times, I didn't even realize the impact it was having on me until someone else pointed it out. And on every one of those occasions, it rarely served either the game or the team. 
and it was never worth the cost. So crunch was often used as a means of pushing the team to deliver more content faster, which worked on the odd occasion, but most of the time it produced poor content, which was bug ridden or created on poor foundations or just unfinished. And I saw some incredibly talented people leave studios as a result. And it often took a long time to fill those gaps if they ever did successfully. And the thing is, as I developed my career and understanding of what I consider the best way to make games over the years, I became more and more certain that it really didn't have to be this way. Crunch happens as a result of bad practice or bad culture or bad management or all of the former. Burning out your team affects your people. They get tired, exhausted and frustrated. They lose their health and they lose their joy. They can start complaining to other people in your team and they suddenly, your studio becomes one of negativity and it can quickly become an us versus them situation um, when in fact, we should all be one team. But really, any responsible leader wouldn't blame their team for that attitude, but should reflect on how they've allowed their team to get there. Burning out your people affects the quality of your game and that in turn affects your business as a result, going back to that diagram we had earlier. It's not a necessary evil, it is not a badge of honor, and it is no reasonable way for a team member to prove their loyalty to you. Loyalty works two ways, which means that anyone in a leadership position has to be respectful and considerate of their people and team members' needs, which includes their health and therefore their work-life balance. You're no longer serving your team, your studio, or your business effectively, and there are always other strings that you can pull at instead of pulling at the one that is likely to have the most detrimental and rippling effects amongst your company. So at our company, I am aware that we're in a fortunate position whereby our stakeholders are equally as supportive of the idea of focusing and producing quality games with quality teams. We're not bound by deadlines or limited funding, which can definitely help to take some of the pressure off. And I know that, for instance, when you are part of a new startup or a work for hire studio that's maybe contractually bound to a date, it can make things trickier. But even in those situations, there are still things you can do to prevent and emit crunch. And I really believe that one of the things that can help with that upfront is by having it as a clear principle right at the beginning. And for us, that comes back to integrity. We want to make games in the right way, which means that we as a team uphold ourselves to fair and ethical standards. And as part of that, it means we don't crunch. So that's instilled into all of our processes as well. For instance, when it comes to setting milestone goals for ourselves, we focus on quality over time. We also identify when someone might be becoming overwhelmed or challenge if someone seems to be over assigning themselves work or is becoming stressed. And we talk it through with them and either provide them with the support or resource that they need to reduce that pressure or we reduce the scope of the work. We don't set ourselves on realistic targets that there's no way of knowing about several months or years from now. We have a roadmap, we keep it updated, but the team focus on what's ahead of them and the smaller incremental steps to get there. And we do regular feature reviews like we talked about. And we also do mid-milestone reviews. And we discuss expectations and we realign and refocus as is necessary for both the team and the game at that moment in time. Our mid-milestone reviews in particular act as a way for the leadership group to identify major risks and put in place strategies to mitigate those. Or for us to simply accept that maybe our expectations were too high. So we rescope and we deliver something smaller but more polished instead. We also rely on our own working experience of working with different people on an individual level. So for me personally, I have to make sure that I have enough of an understanding of how that person works. Is this a person who underestimates their work a lot? And if, it's, if they are, we adjust our expectations accordingly. Our team also like to set their own standards very high, which is fantastic as a general principle. But sometimes just having a conversation with them to understand what they're really trying to achieve and challenging whether all of that's really relevant by asking questions like, what benefit does it actually have to the player? Helps them to realign and adjust their own expectations so they don't end up spending time where it doesn't need to be spent, but instead use their time to focus on the parts that are most important. So I'm going to move on now to discuss how you can survive dealing with the pressures of leadership without going bananas. And I want to stress something to everyone here today. Because whilst you might have come with the intent of developing your own leadership style, maybe because you're striving to be a lead one day, being a lead isn't for everyone, and it doesn't have to be. In the same way that you might not want to do another job, being a manager or a leader is partly a different role, which is different to you being excellent in your field every day and just focusing on excelling at that. 
And whilst you might, might be a great mentor, it's still not quite the same thing. Some people are at their best when they're focused on their craft, whether that's designing levels or creating environment art or writing code. And they don't need or want the responsibilities associated with moving into a leadership position and some of the natural pressures that do come alongside that. And being a lead can mean ha having to maintain the peace and calm in more tense situations. It can mean having very tough conversations and that sometimes you're the punching bag on the team if someone's having their worst day. It also means sometimes bearing the stress for others to reduce the weight from them. Now, I love what I do. It is the best job in the world, and I'm very, very privileged to be in this position and work amongst such wonderful people who make my job very, very enjoyable, and I wouldn't change it. But even despite that, I would be lying if I said at times it hadn't led to some very stressful days and also sleepless nights. I'd say for the first year or two of being in this role, I took way too much pressure home with me, and often in a way whereby I didn't share it or make it visible to others. And that just sucks. It was quite a lonely feeling and quite unhealthy. And part of this was because I was putting way too much pressure on myself to do more than I was capable of in a day. I was trying to wear multiple hats, but all at the same time and expecting myself to deliver in order to keep things easier for everybody else. And it can become a lot. So I had to discipline myself in a more structured way by putting in strategies and processes in place for myself in the same way that I would for others to mitigate and reduce this. And that's something I'd highly recommend you do from day one to prevent stress or burnout overwhelming you as well. But even with these coping strategies, which I'll go into in a moment, being a lead still isn't for everyone and that's totally acceptable. I would honestly say that if you love it and it will bring you joy to support others, then do it. Um, but if the stress will outweigh that, then maybe don't. Ultimately, you have to be able to deal with things in a pragmatic and calm way if you're in any position of leadership. Why? Because other people look to you in stressful situations and they will reflect your demeanor. You can only serve others well when you're well yourself. So one way for surviving the pressures um, and dealing with this is that when you're presented with a problem, View it as another task and find the solution to resolving it and present that to your team. And if you don't know the solution yet, just be honest and reassure them that you'll find one, but also ask for their input. Remember that your team are also there to support you and that mindset will automatically help to alleviate any pressure. And if you happen to be the punching bag on a given day and someone has said something controversial, try really hard not to respond in an aggravated or hot-headed way. If you can't say anything constructive or calm at that moment in time, just acknowledge what they've said and say nothing more and tell them you'll chat later instead. And later should be whenever you're able to bring yourself back to that calm and logical demeanor, even if it means sleeping on it. You're still human, so you're not gonna get it right every time. And in those moments where you think you might not, it's better to have patience and think, think things through. Okay, so having responsibility is something that comes with part of the role. However, earlier we talked about our values and why giving the team some autonomy can be a good thing for culture. So one of the strategies that you can use that will benefit your team and yourself is by giving them some ownership and making them accountable for the work. And this is a sliding scale based on their abilities and seniority. So for instance, a senior level designer on our team might be accountable for a whole level's delivery, whereas a junior designer might only be accountable for a small set of puzzles. I'm still ultimately responsible, but now they have more ambition and drive to accomplish their goals because they know they have an opportunity to make a real impact on the game with that little bit of accountability. And in doing so, I'm not overlooking my responsibility as I'm still there as a guide to provide direction, but just giving them a bit more ownership. But I'm equally putting my trust in them, which means that I shouldn't be constantly looking over their shoulder. And this ties into the importance of not micromanaging. As leads, we drive forward development of the team and the game, but we should never micromanage. And the moment you start to do that is the same moment you become a nag and you disrupt and ultimately you demonstrate a lack of trust. You end up stripping team members of any accountability or autonomy and they lose motivation. If you feel a need to micromanage, then I'd ask yourself why. For instance, is the reason why because you feel like you can't trust one of your team members because you've got concerns about their performance? Well, you should probably address that underlying problem instead. The goal is to give your people the space and time needed to flourish and produce really good results. 
check in with them in a constructive way when it makes sense, but you don't need them to update Jira every five minutes. We're making games, not ticking boxes on checklists. And this also helps them to continually learn and grow and still feel enthusiastic about what they do. Being in a leadership position doesn't mean doing everything yourself. It means bringing people together and leading them towards a common goal. The culture should be to confront challenges together. So another strategy for surviving the pressures is to build strong working partnerships with a few key allies. And it's healthy to do this with internal team members, but also with external partners, such as your publishers. There are some things that you just shouldn't discuss with the whole team in detail for a whole variety of reasons, whether that's confidentiality, being sensitive and aware of how the information might stress other people out, how it might distract people, or because it might simply be a burden for them to know. But you should find the person or people who can sometimes be an exception to that rule, the person who can be the Hugh Jackman to your Ryan Reynolds or the Wolverine to your Deadpool. An example for me is our creative director. And whilst we encourage a culture of um, honesty, there's always going to be um, some people who are hesitant to call out their leads if they think there's something going wrong. But this person has never been afraid to have the tough conversations with me or advise me on something that he thinks I'm missing. And he brings me a valuable but different perspective. And I have a lot of respect and trust for him as a result. And to those of you here from my team today, please don't tell him that I said any of this because I'll never hear the end of it. Um, in all seriousness, this is an example of a person who I feel very comfortable having very open discussions with about potentially difficult or strenuous subjects. And I use them as a sounding board. But equally, I have to actively ensure that I don't offload the responsibility to them because that wouldn't be fair or responsible of me. So those decisions still have to be yours, but having these conversations certainly provide me with different perspectives and help me to reach decisions with more clarity. Now, I'm not someone who likes to leave things hanging or unfinished. For instance, I'm really not someone who can go to bed comfortably knowing that there's a leftover slice of cake in the fridge that needs eating, because that's just a crime. Um, I consider this a strength, but I also consider that this used to be one of my biggest weaknesses. Now, we talked about burnout earlier and why it sucks. But sometimes, as a person running the studio, I feel the responsibility to overwork to deliver. And the thing is, if and when I do that, it's not really an example I want to set for my team. And it makes me feel like a total hypocrite. On the one hand, here I am making sure that they don't crunch. And on the other, here I am kind of quiet crunching. So thankfully, in those instances, my team rightly call me out on it. But also, they ask me what they can do to help. And actually, this acts as a signal or a reminder to me that, one, my team are pretty damn awesome, but also people are very understanding. So if I can't get something done, they trust me to know that I'll get it done when I can, or they'll help me with it. And that expectation of well-being, which I have for them, they also have for me. So that's one thing that immediately alleviates the pressure. But something that really helped me as a tool is to organize and discipline myself by providing myself with more structure. Now, I love wearing many hats, and to some extent, that leads to my own schedule becoming very naturally chaotic. And on top of that, as a lead, there are inevitably days when things come up which I didn't expect and I have to prioritize. In the same way, though, that we help our teams to understand their priorities on a given day, every Friday, I look at my list of things to do the following week. And to provide myself context, I prioritize them based on their urgency or based on whether they are a dependency for something or someone else. But I never set myself a full schedule for the week because it would be unrealistic to things, think that other things wouldn't pop up. And on weeks where perhaps more pops up than I'd anticipated, and if I start to feel overwhelmed, I'm now okay with taking a step back and thinking, what's the real impact of not doing this thing right now? So consider if there is going to be a major impact, or any impact at all at that moment in time. And if the, answer's okay, if the answer's no, then just be okay with dropping it. You can't do everything all of the time, and the more you become accepting of that, the less likely you are to burn yourself out. And that means you'll also continue to love what you do. Like when I come downstairs the next morning to open my fridge and find there's a piece of cake waiting for me for breakfast. Equally, you should use those as opportunities. As the wise Samwise Gamgee once said, share the load, Mr. Frodo. So take these wise words and share the workload with others. In the same way that your team, um, that you're there to, sorry, to support your team, perhaps there are opportunities here where your team can support you. 
Consider who in your team might be ready to step up, promote them if they're ready for it, and share some of the tasks and give them some of that autonomy. For instance, when our studio started, I was running all of our one-to-ones with everybody on the team. But as the team grew, I knew this wouldn't be maintainable. And at that point, we put more of a leadership group in place and set up clear processes, which allowed discipline leads to manage some of the one-to-ones instead. That shared the responsibility, but it also built more trust and confidence. And also consider expanding your team, or if you're not the decision maker here, consider asking for more people on your team to support your role if you need it. Maybe they can help to eat the cake, but there's no guarantees on whether that will make you feel better or worse. Another thing that you can do to help survive the pressures of leadership is um, the ability to make decisions with confidence. Now, there are a few criteria that I use to help me with this, such as considering whether my decision will benefit the team, whether it will align with the game direction, whether my decision will align with the business needs, or whether it will resolve what we set out to achieve. These questions can be useful tools to provide you with the confidence you need. And in some situations, you might even be able to rely on existing data if there is any to support what you're thinking. Or sometimes the right thing to do is rely on your gut. In any case, it's incredibly important to make decisions with confidence. And if you don't do this, it can create uncertainty and anxiety amongst your team. And potentially it can become very, very costly if the absence of a decision acts as a blocker or hinders development. For example, there's also other tools at your disposal, like running a risk assessment. And this could be as simple as thinking through the pros and cons or writing them into a list, or maybe with a bigger decision, running a risk assessment meeting. If you do end up making a decision, knowing that you're not completely sure where it's going to lead, you can still make it confidently. Just explain why the decision was taken and reassure your team what you'll do to mitigate any potential risks or consequences. At a worst case, a wrong decision is a failure to learn from. Just be sure to fail fast. So going back to our good friend, but what happens when you do get the decision wrong? Well, like Thanos, mistakes are inevitable, but you have to act with integrity. That means you have to take responsibility for and own the mistake. The worst thing that you can do is make excuses for it or try to blame it on someone else because that is a terrible example of leadership and will make your team feel incredibly let down. But when you do own up to your error, you'll instead gain their respect and you'll demonstrate that it's also a safe space where sometimes things can go wrong. So long as you don't keep repeating the mistake and instead you learn from it, your team will be quick to forgive as well. And be sure to correct the mistake as soon as possible and make that known. You also have to be mindful of being resilient here and not letting this knock you too much. Otherwise, it could start to impact um, your performance, which could also impact the team's morale. Except that sometimes you're just going to get things wrong and give yourself the same grace that you would give to others. But what do you do in a situation when someone else on your team makes a mistake? It can be incredibly tempting when someone makes an error that's obvious to you to fix it yourself because it might be easier or faster to do so. The problem, though, with that is that you can't expect them to learn or improve. And if someone on your team gets something wrong, don't take care of it yourself and try not to give it to somebody else to fix instead. Remember, we have to make people accountable. And part of being accountable is cleaning up your own work. In the long term, the more efficient and beneficial solution for everyone is to do the following. Explain the issue with a clear example provide actionable improvement steps or explain how you would go about fixing it and agree a mutual timeline to review their improvements. You can't expect someone to improve if you don't give them the opportunity to do so. However, sometimes that doesn't work. And in cases where someone has consistent poor performance or is a fundamental clash to the culture of your team, it is your responsibility to remove them. I want to state something very clearly here. Firing someone is the worst part of my job, and I absolutely hate it and use it as the last thing at my disposal. But putting people first means making tough decisions. And sometimes, if that obstacle happens to be another person, then it is my responsibility to deal with it. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice to your team. Now, like I said, I try to use this as a last option, and I exhaust other steps first. However, allowing it to linger is also not acceptable. So you have to take any other steps fast. And if they fail, you, as the keeper of your team, are responsible for making that call. 
So being a responsible leader means making tough decisions and acting fast to remove any disruption or hostility. So I'm not going to read through all of these, but here you'll find a quick summary of the key do's and don'ts as we've been discussing. And I hope I've given you a little bit of insight as to my leadership style and how we've designed processes which put our people first and help them to thrive, allow for a supportive, collaborative and inspiring environment, help to prevent, mitigate and identify failure fast, deal with problems in a constructive way and reward and celebrate success for everyone. As leaders, we may wield power, but always remember what the late great Uncle Ben once said. With great power comes great responsibility. Oh, and before we wrap up, I've been asked to remind you lovely people to please rate my session. However, I have forgotten my bribe, so you'll just have to be honest. Um, and if you can follow me or reach out to me with any questions as well on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you very much for listening. And now opening up to any questions. <laughs> I think we've got someone over there, but we need them. Um, we've we'll just wait for the mic. Thank you. Hi there, thank you for the talk. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is about micromanagement. Yeah. Um, and how you identify when you or someone, like one of your leads, is in particular because they're invested in the subject or because they know what they want and when they're just micromanaging how do you, how do you know when it's uh, together? good question um partly this comes from getting to know your team i think um as i mentioned kind of building relationships and i think in instances where i've seen people do that um it's been quite rare um but it's happened because they have started getting stressed about something it's not usually because they are invested in that particular topic. I'd hope they're invested in everything. Um, but you also start to see um, them acting a bit more nervous, them acting a bit more stressed. And in turn, the people they're dealing with also reacting quite negatively. And to be honest, it comes back to um, a little bit about what I was saying about sitting with your team, even if it's virtually. Um, if someone's going to have a conversation with someone and then they walk away going, ah, oh, the person at the desk, it's, it's probably something going wrong there. Um, and I also notice it um, if, for, for instance, one of our leads or maybe one of our production team members is spending a lot of time talking to the same person over and over again, I would go and question why, because that means they're probably not giving that person the space to get on with their work. So is there an underlying problem or is this person, perhaps the person who is micromanaging just doesn't understand what they're doing and they need to have more of a transparent conversation about what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's usually the way I deal with it. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, got another question over here? Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. If you have an employee that is very hard headed and stubborn and overconfident, potentially even cocky and doesn't quite fit into the team, what are some of the steps you can try to take before the inevitable termination if that is needed? Yeah. So that comes down to kind of the improvement process I was talking about, and that feeds into our one-to-ones as well. Um, so in our one-to-ones, we do those every three months where we get 360 feedback from people, and we present it all very transparently. Um, we collect the 360 feedback, the person running the one-to-one -one kind of summarizes what's there and makes sure it makes sense. And then we provide that person with clear examples of where they're going wrong. So if there is somebody who has an ego and is showing it, let's say, um, I would be quite honest and say, okay, here's an example of where you did X and this was the problem with it. And this is how I suggest you can present that information to somebody instead. And to be honest, you know, obviously we'd hope for an improvement, but if that continues, then like I was saying, there are fundamental culture clash and you need to consider whether it's more detrimental to have them on your team. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I think we might be struggling for time, right? Um, so, but I will be available for any questions outside. So if you do want to chat, I'll be around. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.